Our second uh, presenter this afternoon is Dr. Panos Suguniotis um, from the University of Manchester, and he's going to speak on a gene-based case control association study using exome sequencing identifies the molecular basis of two monogenic disorders. And give him a round of applause. As well. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm Panos, I'm an ophthalmologist, I work in Manchester. And uh, the broad uh, theme of this talk is, of this talk is uh, genomics, informatics, uh, and uh, um, uh, a little bit of statistical analysis, and that's all on rare disease. So this is a, a brief outline of the talk. First, I'm just uh, going to talk about uh, uh, the exciting development, the ever-evolving field of clinical DNA sequencing. And I'm going to talk about how these technologies have uh, helped us uh, understand uh, why some of our patients uh, get uh, visual impairment. And uh, uh, then I'm going to tell you about how we merged all these mechanistic uh, insights that we got uh, to uh, produce some clinical impact, so to improve the diagnosis uh, in our patients. I'll just finish with some wider implications. Now, this is a classic graph. There's a website that keeps track of the cost of uh, DNA sequencing. Uh, this is logarithmic scale, and what you can see here is uh, while uh, it took $100 million and 10 years to sequence the first genome, now you can sequence one with $1,000 in an afternoon. So this is a, a massive uh, technological advancement, not only in biomedicine. Uh, it's 100,000 times drop in price. Uh, and uh, you can see that the, uh, the turning point was somewhere in 2007, and uh, uh, that was due to the introduction of the so-called next generation sequencing platforms. So these machines, they have a massive throughput, and uh, they can uh, generate uh, much more uh, data than uh, massive amounts of data at a much lower price compared to the predecessor, uh, Sanger sequencing. But, uh, but there is a problem. So uh, the problem is no longer getting the data. The problem is analyzing the data. Uh, so it's not uh, how good data you have anymore. It's how good analysis you can do. So this, the, uh, the challenge shifted from uh, producing the data to analyzing them. And uh, uh, the main issue is pinpointing uh, the one pathogenic true positive uh, mutation among the background of uh, benign uh, variants. And we all have lots of them, so uh, here's what uh, each one of us uh, has in terms of these uh, false positive changes. Uh, and uh, as a result, uh, if you, uh, even if you use the best test that is uh, available to test the genome, you'll get the answer only in 50% uh, or less of the cases. So uh, the aims of the study is uh, to develop efficient ways uh, and filters of mining through uh, DNA sequencing data. And uh, if we do that, we're hoping to identify some new genes and uh, also to improve the yield, improve that 50% that I discussed before. About. So uh, I'm an ophthalmologist, so just a brief reminder about the eye. So there's the front bit, uh, it comes in, there's two parts. There's the front bit that is a focusing device, and there's the back of the eye uh, called the retina, and that's the part that does the, uh, the clever bit, so the clever part of the eye, uh, I would call it. Uh, and uh, we studied the uh, inherited uh, diseases of the retina. Um, now, these are relatively common, so they're the leading cause of blindness uh, uh, among uh, working age adults. Uh, so. Um, it's, it's quite an important uh, uh, morbidity there. And uh, lots of people have uh, worked on these disorders for many years. Uh, and uh, uh, although we have found a lar large number of uh, uh, genes there, still our uh, diagnostic rate is at uh, uh, 50%. So if you sequence 100 patients with inherited retinal disease, you're going to get the answer in 15. So, uh, that's uh, our study design. So I would just like to put the emphasis on the study design because I think that's what uh, quite sp special about this study because it, it helped us. So we got some exciting findings and made the most of our resources. Um, so what you would normally do is you would see a patient and then you would request a genetic test and that's like a coin toss, 50% you yeah, get the answer, 50% you won't. But we didn't do that. So what we did is we looked quite hard and tried to find that f at features that uh, give you some insight about the mechanism. So uh, we didn't focus on the diagnosis, we just focused on a phenotypic feature that we thought might tell you something. And then we didn't, still didn't go to sequence, we just got some more patients having the same feature, sharing the same characteristic phenotypic feature, and we analyzed them all together. I just pulled the data and looked for the overlap. So the uh, phenotype that we looked at, uh, that we looked at was uh, a specific uh, uh, type of appearance uh, uh, based on, uh, on uh, imaging of the retina. So it's called bullseye at some point uh, uh, by some people. Uh, um, it doesn't really look like a bullseye, but anyway. Uh, and uh, we, as I said, we didn't go on one patient. We just uh, uh, collected a number of patients. So I was working at UCL with Professor Webster. We collected 23 patients with this uh, uh, specific appearance. 
And uh, then uh, what, uh, uh, here they are, you can see they all have this kind of bullseye appearance. Uh, and uh, what we did is we took a blood sample, we put in one of these high throughput uh, sequencers, uh, sequencing machines. We use a, a, a technique called exon sequencing, which where you're analyzing the 1% uh, protein coding, the interpretable part of the genome, really. And uh, then we spoke with uh, colleagues in UCL, and we got some more controls there. So we co took some control samples. Now, there's some complex statistics going on throughout the talk. I'm not going to go into the details, but that's kind of, of, of part of the interesting bit. So uh, we did a, a power calculation here. Uh, and because the odds ratio is uh, for all these mutations 1 to 100, this is uh, what we got from the power calculation. It looks skewed if you're used to, com uh, to uh, common disease uh, and uh, genome-wide association trials. But for this type of disorders, this is the right uh, amount that you need. So uh, uh, I have an interest in, uh, in programming, so I do lots of programming myself and in informatics, uh, and uh, I worked uh, together with Vincent Planiol again from uh, UCL, and we developed a, a, a pipeline that's a, a computer program that analyzed the data. So there was a massive amount of data, so uh, 2000, more than 2,500 uh, exomes, uh, and uh, what we did uh, is uh, we, we got a, a program, in, in a, and uh, what you do, you need to define what is a candidate variant of the program. You need to tell them, I think that's a good candidate. Now, because our diseases are rare, a good candidate will have to be rare, and because we expect a significant impact, it will have to look like it has some impact on the protein. And uh, then what we did is we did a simple binomial test, uh, looking for an excess of these candidates in cases versus controls. Uh, so it just did a case control study, really. Uh, Another clever bit was that we did it on the gene base. So we analyzed all the uh, variation in a genome at once. So we didn't look at variant by variant. We just looked at it on the gene basis, and we compared genes. And uh, first, uh, our, we defined as candidate protein truncating variants or nonsense changes. Uh, uh, so these are variants that stop the protein. Uh, you don't, shouldn't have any protein. We didn't input any hypothesis there, uh, or autosomal recessive, autosomal dominant X link. We just left it like that. And on top of the list came a gene called TTLL5. Uh, we got a really decent p-value. It doesn't quite reach uh, genome-wide significance. It's a different talk. How do you define that? But it's, it's a bit off, uh, uh, not too much. Uh, so we needed more evidence. You always need more evidence, though. Uh, and uh, what we did is uh, we uh, spoke at the newly formed at that point UK Inherited Retinal Disease Consortium, our colleagues there, and we asked, do you have any more of these patients with this uh, bullseye type of thing or with mutations in these genes? In this gene? And uh, uh, we were quite lucky. They had, uh, uh, we got two additional cases. So those are the two uh, from, from our study. And then we got like two additional. So four cases, uh, three of those had uh, stopped mutations in the gene. So this was a, 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 the solid evidence evidence that this is a novel gene for inherited retinal disease. So out of 23 patients, uh, two had mutations in this novel gene, eight had mutations in previously reported genes, and there were 13 unsolved cases. So what do you do? So you just go back and you run your program again. Uh, and at this point, instead of taking the, only the truncating variants, we took the sequence altering variants, so missense changes, and then we assumed the recessive model as well. And we ran the program, on top came this gene uh, called uh, DRAM2. Again, we got a p-value, a, a little bit worse, but uh, you, you just need to remember that all these gene mapping studies, they weren't even uh, using p-values before. So at least we got, we got a score with certain uh, level of, of confidence. And uh, uh, because our p-value was slightly worse than before, we spoke with more people uh, in uh, the UK and, <laughs> and in Europe. Uh, and, uh, um, uh, we were really excited to hear from Leeds that they had a family, a large family, with mutations in the same gene. And then uh, we were a bit less excited, but anyway, there were more families from Ghent and Bonn, uh, so we had a total of uh, five families with this, um, uh, with this disease. So that's an, a second uh, gene, uh, a second uh, uh, gene associated with inherited retinal disease. So uh, just a brief overview of this. Uh, the important thing is we defined some key phenotypic features. We didn't just use the, uh, the name of the diagnosis. We just went for some key phenotypic features. We find a cluster of cases sharing these features. Uh, and then we performed the exome sequencing. We did case control uh, analysis there. And we computed a gene-based uh, p-value. So that's, uh, uh, it looks simple. Uh, there's lots of complexity there because there's lots of uh, statistics uh, that you need to do uh, and uh, lots of filtering based on ethnicity, et cetera. But I won't go into this for this talk. Now, how does all this help patients? Uh, so I just need to remember here, we're, we're, I'm talking about rare disease. So um, rare disease is not really that rare collectively. So uh, in each row, there will be one person that will be affected with a rare disease uh, at some point in their lifetime. So that's one in 17. Uh, and uh, uh, so it, it does matter. Uh, and uh, um, 
usually if you have a rare disease, it will take a long time till you get your diagnosis. Um, it, it will take lots of scans probably or lots of tests uh, and uh, you just need to meet the right people in the right centers uh, if, if you're going to get your diagnosis. Now, um, the assumption is that if we take all these genes and we put them in a panel uh, uh, of, and we sequence them in patients with, uh, with the disorder, we can accelerate the diagnosis, we'll f come to a diagnosis much faster, uh, we can get better management because we don't need to go around doing scans, etc. And uh, we won't need this super expert, so uh, it's kind of uh, relevant for uh, more people. It just reduces this inequality of access. And this is what uh, Professor Black in Manchester has uh, done uh, for inherited retinal disease. There's a test that um, analyzes patients for inherited retinal disease, and I've been working with him in Manchester. And uh, what we did is uh, we looked at the population that I'm uh, interested in. I'm, uh, I'm interested in pediatric ophthalmology, so I looked at uh, children with inherited retinal disease, and we got a, a very surprising 85% diagnostic yield for the test. So um, this is a bit of a paradigm shift for this condition. So it really changes uh, how you approach them, uh, and it changes the, the care pathways for these patients. But, so if you introduce a genetic test early on, you can make a difference. And we have it in press. Uh, um, just, uh, in, uh, it's coming up in a few weeks. Now, uh, that's diagnosis, but what about the management? Unfortunately, I don't have lots of data. I don't have any randomized control things to show you, but I will show you an interesting case. So uh, there's a child um, here that we saw in clinic uh, that he was uh, born with poor vision from early on, and he was diagnosed with an isolated inherited retinal uh, disease. Now, um, the family became interested in genetic testing because they had another child with the same condition, and uh, we uh, performed that. And we found mutations in this gene called IQCB1. Now, that's an interesting gene because some patients with mutations in this will get uh, isolated disease, uh, and some patients with mutations that will get retinal disease with kidney dysfunction. So uh, we went and checked the kidney function, and the serum creatinine was three times uh, uh, more than it should be, and we did a renal ultrasound, it had small kidneys. Um, so we start, uh, the child started on hemodialysis, and then he had the transplant uh, from his mother. Uh, and this matters because uh, we do know that acute retinal disease, he then never went into acute retinal disease, uh, and this is, uh, that significantly improves the prognosis of uh, the transplant and uh, for life for the patient, and uh, was published in uh, Lancet. So, um, but uh, what are the wider implications of this for a rare disease? So uh, the main thing here is uh, that I, I feel um, I want to highlight is how underutilized clinical information is. Uh, so uh, by using clinical information uh, carefully and with a, in the right way, you can uh, enhance uh, the, um, the role of genetic testing and genetics. You can find more things and you can come to a molecular diagnosis much faster. Uh, also, if you're studying rare disease, I highly recommend that you try an approach like this. It's this uh, uh, to use a statistical clustering approach, cluster uh, uh, patients with the same features, and do an objective assessment, because this is quite likely that it will give you a meaningful result, or at least uh, you will know uh, with some level of certainty uh, how uh, close you are. Um, but to collect these clusters, you often need this cross-institution and transnational uh, collaboration uh, like we did. Now. Um, the problem with this is that uh, finding a language to communicate uh, the findings and how do you describe uh, your findings. And it's also to find, not only with, between clinicians, but also with computers that will analyze your data. Uh, and uh, that's something I've been working on the last couple of years. Now, um, I've, I'm using uh, an uh, online uh, free access uh, platform uh, tool called Human Phenotyping Ontology. This was developed by uh, Peter Robinson in Berlin. And this is essentially a, a, a dictionary to enable a global phenotypic sharing. Uh, but this is more than a, just a medical dictionary because uh, it, ha it includes computable descriptions of the human disease. Uh, so what does that mean? That uh, you need to define every term logically and you need to have them interrelated uh, and you can uh, do uh, clever analysis and statistics uh, using that. So many consortia have, uh, are using now uh, HP on a, uh, on a regular basis and some key uh, studies have used it. Um, so it's, it's a really interesting um, a tool. Uh, um, now, uh, I've been working on the I aspect of the human phenotyping ontology. I've been regularly uh, adding terms and trying to form links and do definitions uh, for the last couple of years. And when the HPO paper came uh, out last week, actually, this is an update on HPO. Uh, the tool has been around since 2008. Uh, I was pleased to see that we are second, uh, and uh, um, just a few more sleepless nights, and I'll cut the uh, nervous system there. Um, but it's not just about the quantity. Uh, it's, it's also uh, about the quality of the terms, uh, and they have a way of assessing that uh, same paper, and we have uh, quite uh, refined, uh, the IHP is one of the most refined uh, uh, ontologies uh, uh, that there are. Um, so we do have a, a tool there uh, to use. 
So just my final summary, uh, so I've used uh, uh, this phenotype-driven cluster analysis together with exome sequencing and I've identified four uh, novel retinal disease-associated genes. I described two, there are another two uh, I'm going to. Um, that uh, all these mechanistic insights that you can get, they can have a role for patients here and now, not in the future. You can, uh, we have a, a really good test for children with inherited retinal disease with a very high yield. Um, but the main uh, thing that I, I, that I find um, interesting here is that I, in my head this work reconciles evidence-based medicine uh, with uh, precision medicine. So evidence-based medicine is all these large meta-analyses, these very interesting statistical approaches, this one-size-fit-all uh, drugs, uh, and uh, um, the um, precision medicine it focuses on the outliers, so on the um, people that aren't covered by this precision medicine approach. And uh, I feel that here, if you just do this cluster, use the HPO and uh, with a collaborative spirit, you can move towards an evidence-based uh, precision medicine. Thank you very much. So I have the clock there. Thank you.